Greetings and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to the organizers, panelists, and participants, wherever you may be. My name is Georgie Chikata, and I'm based at the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana, and I'm honored to be the moderator for the fifth dialogue in the dialogue series on the theme, Spectres of Crisis, Race of Hope. The dialogue series is a, a fortnightly event, and today's topic is COVID-19 and the future, feminist perspectives from the global south. The COVID-19 pandemic and the global economic downturn have exposed the deep crisis of social reproduction across the world and the extent of precarious and essential work undertaken by women. Whether in paid or unpaid work in rural or urban areas, women have carried the burden of the crisis worldwide and have been subjected to escalating violence. The consequences of the current crisis on gender relations will be far reaching. This panel brings together scholar activists from the three continents of the South to deliberate on these issues from feminist perspectives. This panel's work is a critical function which has to be performed over and over again. And we are grateful to the Agrarian South Network and its partners for the opportunity to discuss these issues. As COVID-19 spread, spread, and along with its panic of global proportions, the dominant discourse of we are all in it together and everyone is affected also spread. However, signal events that soon unfolded told a different story. From the migrant workers stuck in limbo because of lockdown regulations, to efforts to feed people in need one hot meal a day, to the massive disruptions of the livelihoods of the majority of workers, and the volatility of food prices, it soon became very clear that it was critical to understand how the conditions before the crisis and state responses to the crisis were determinants of who would be the most affected and who would actually profit from the pandemic. A number of issues are pertinent in this regard, and I just want to flag a few. First is a massive contraction of the global economy and its implications for economies that are export commodity dependent and based on extractives and agriculture and the lives of their working people. Second, COVID-19 showed up the continuing fallouts from five decades of neoliberal globalization and the financialization of capital and the normalization of precarious work and the crisis of reproduction. Related to this is the entrenched and discriminatory gender segmentation of work and the resultant gender pay and asset gaps across the world. Third, women's unpaid and unrecognized reproduction work as a critical subsidy for capital accumulation and the reproduction of labor. Unpaid productive and reproductive work are very much like the planet's carbon sinks. They are taken for granted and without such labor, there would be no life on earth. This labor, which is full of drudgery and secured by patriarchal normative power, has become even more critical for coping with the fallouts of COVID-19. All over the global South, housing deficits, the exponential growth of domestic and care work, children stuck at home, and women's expanded roles as, as, as homeschoolers on, a, on continents with some of the youngest populations and the least schooled mothers the increase in gender-based violence, the threat of higher attrition rates for girls at all levels of schooling, particularly those from poor families, are all issues crying out for attention. The situation has also raised fundamental questions about the gender effects of COVID responses and the long-standing gender biases in economic and social policies. For example, the gender implications of social protection measures, such as cash transfers, and subsidies ostensibly to ease deficits in access to services for the poor. It has also been observed that many governments hiding under the cover of COVID-19 have been repressing citizens, passing draconian and unnecessary laws and engaging in acts of corruption and grand theft of national resources in the name of COVID financing. We also need to underline women's everyday responses as acts of survival, dignity and resistance the organizational strategies also deserve our attention as we examine the rays of light and hope in this situation. They are only, these are only a few of the issues that will be tackled by the panel and the discussions that will follow. 
I now want to introduce our panel, which is made up of Nancy Kachingwe, Nilanjana Mukia, Gabriela Mendez Chavez, and Achana Prasad, in the order in which they they we will hear them. Nancy Kachingwe is an independent gender and public policy advisor based in Harare, Zimbabwe. She works mainly with women's rights organizations, social movements, and NGOs using a feminist political economy approach to unpack the many urgent development challenges of the day. She's a co-founder of a new initiative called South Feminist Futures, which aims to strengthen collective South South feminist collaboration networking, educating, learning, theorizing, analyzing, and solidarity for the 21st century. Nilanjana Mukia is a feminist activist based in Delhi, India. She has worked on women's human rights ranging from gender-based violence, sexual and reproductive health, women's labor rights, and social reproduction and care. She uses her feminist political economy approach to advance economic justice and rights in collaboration with movements, NGOs, and networks. She, together with Nancy, are co-founders of the South Feminist Futures. Gabriela Mendes Chavez is an economist from Brazil and a master's student in global political economy at the Federal University of ABC. She's also a researcher at NEP Afro, a center for African-American studies in the areas of gender, race, and work. Gabriela is also a member of No Front Financial Empowerment, a platform that works with training on financial education and political economy together with social movements such as the Quilombos and the Black Women's Movements and people in vulnerable situations. Achana Prasad is professor at the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies at JNU. She specializes in research on the contemporary history of adversity livelihoods, labor and resistance, women and labor, environmental and labor history. She has also been helping many grassroots organizations in their work with home-based workers. She's also the associate editor of Agrarian South Journal of Political Economy, which is a tri-continental journal published by Sage Publications for the Agrarian South Network. She's the author of many books and articles on her research. Before our panelists take the floor, I'd like to acknowledge the partnerships that are the, at the heart of this dialogue. The core partners are the Agrarian South Network, the Samoyo African Institute for Agrarian Studies in Zimbabwe, and ActionAid India. The supporting partners are the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies at JNU in India, the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana, the Global University for Sustainability in Hong Kong in China, the Postgraduate Program in World Political Economy and, and the Educational Technologies and Languages Unit at the Federal University of ABC in, in Brazil. Now a question, now a word about our question and answer sec section. If you have any questions, please send written questions in Zoom and Facebook and this will be posed to the panelists. The dialogue is in English. However, written questions can be in any other language and they'll be translated and forwarded to the moderator by our team. A recorded video will appear later with Portuguese and Spanish subtitles. Without further ado, I would like to ask Nancy to take the floor. Thank you very much. Hi, um, afternoon from Harare. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Georgie, um, for putting us together on this panel um, and to Agrarian South Network for um, another one of, uh, of uh, a series of really interesting um, discussions. Um, and it's really great to be privileged enough to bring in a feminist um, perspective around some of these issues. Um, we were asked to uh, talk a little bit about state responses from a feminist perspective. Um, and so I will look at sort of two aspects, uh, one in terms of what that means for our own sort of movement building um, and why it's important to center feminist perspectives in those. 
And then secondly, a little bit of comment around the, um, the Africa responses. Um, so the, the title of the presentation is um, COVID-19 and the Heteropatriarchal State, a Moment of Reckoning. Um, so I think the first thing to talk about in terms of state responses is the nature of the states we're dealing with. And quite often, I think the sort of, the fact that these are patriarchal states and we are governed by patriarchy um, is often left out when we're having these discussions. And I think this is one of the dimensions that feminists um, keep trying to insist on, um, often, often being neglected. But this is a good moment for us to try and put together these, the issue of gender relations and how this impacts, how this is important, both in terms of the responses to the pandemic and our analysis, our collective analysis of what exactly is going on. So um, um, a set of challenges around this, yes, another normal is possible, but we need a collective framing across issues, positionalities and objectives. We have many broad agreements on the problems, um, but the agenda within, um, but often our agendas both within feminist movements, but also between feminist movements in the South and other social movements tend to be quite fragmented. Um, so we need to build those bridges across our, uh, across our issues and perspectives. Um, South or South feminist or third world black indigenous or post-colonial feminist articulations of our struggles is that we are fighting white supremacist, imperialist, capitalist patriarchy. This is a fairly old um, formulation that, it, uh, that you may have heard before. These are interlocking systems of oppression that must be fought on all fronts. As third world or South feminists, we do not see how it is possible to fight the global capitalist hegemon while leaving colonial heteropatriarchal hegemony intact. So feminist concepts, scholarship, analysis, and activism are central or must be central to revisioning a new normal. If we don't address inequitable gender relations, then any agenda for post-COVID transformation will be incomplete, if not fail altogether. COVID shows how the personal is political, and more specifically, it has exposed the pro problematic separation under capitalism of sites of production, where, which are counted as spaces where there's value, um, where, there, where wealth is created and which is masculine, um, and sites of reproduction where there is no economic value, which is feminine and dependent on the outside, often now being presented as, as, as um, not just dependent, but actually drawing resources from the productive, um, a cost to the productive economy. Um, so that division has been, has been clearly shown to be problematic as we've had to, um, um, as our sites of production and our sites of reproduction have, have merged in many ways. Um, gender, gender equality, unfortunately, has often been the poor relation of social struggles and seen as marginal. We oppose military, and these are the contradictions in terms of often how we view things. We oppose militarism, but don't see its connections to gender-based violence, even, for example, when wars are fought um, by US imperialism on the basis of liberating women. We oppose labor exploitation and precarity, but have no regard for women's autonomous economic security outside the heteropatriarchal family. We want labor rights and the right to work, but we will not oppose the the, but we will not support the decriminalization of sex work and sex workers. We oppose imperialism, but refuse to support women's self-determination in relation to their own bodies, their sexuality, their sexual orientation, or reproductive choices. We oppose an unjust global financial debt system, but fail to recognize the reproductive debt owed to women for their subsidy to the economies and the costs that they bear for the sustaining of human life. We, reje we, we reject that capitalism's externalization of its costs. We reject capitalism's externalization of its costs on the environment, but we are not as concerned about the externalization of, of capitalism, cap capitalism's human and social costs onto women's unpaid care and domestic labor burden. 
and gender-based violence isn't getting better under the system, it's getting worse. So as long as capitalism succeeds, cap capitalism and patriarchy succeed in making these connections invisible again and again, we will not get the transformation that we need. We have to challenge heteropatriarchy as an enabler of imperialist racist capitalism. And that's a very core feminist principle. Anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist agendas and movements still ignore the primary site of labor exploitation, which is women's unpaid and underpaid care and domestic work. This exploitation is facilitated through enduring systems of patriarchy, male supremacy, male privilege, but also through a global racialized gendered division of labor. Our histories of anti-capitalist struggle have often erased the fact that colonialism and imperialism dispossessed women first of their access to resources, their political and cultural status, their autonomy. Colonialism outside, outsourced the control of indigenous women to men as husbands, heads of households, and gave white and indigenous men exclusive control over social, economic, and political institutions, whether these are religious, educational, or, or, or in government. Decolonial, decolon, decolonization only went a certain way to address the highly gendered nature of these dispossessions, restoring some rights to women, but not all, and leaving the superstructure of male control over women and over other governance institutions intact. So our search for a better post-COVID future has to acknowledge that patriarchal power has enabled and been complicit in the, in the prevailing global power architectures and power relations, be these state citizen, capital and labor, north and south, human and environment. We have moved from the heteropatriarchal development state of post-independence to the heteropatriarchal neoliberal or neo-fascist state, which is fast losing legitimacy um, as manifested through growing authoritarianism, militarism and violence. And we've also witnessed at, at local level this, uh, um, that the only way of the heteropatriarchal neoliberal state to, a, to manage a pandemic is through lockdown. Fascism is on the rise and it's basically patriarchy on steroids, but the, danger and, but the dangers and failures of patriarchal uh, governments have been clearly exposed by the pandemic. So gender equality, gender equality and gender inequality are not soft issues, but rather pass and, part and parcel of the DNA of the current white supremacist, imperialist, neo-colonial, neoliberal global order. A, a word about care, um, oh my time has run out. A word about care, uh, social reproduction and social depletion. Um, so in developed countries with large formal economies, the link between um, care and domestic work has been made visible by the fact, for example, that school closures have been the major obstacle in rebooting the um, capitalist consumerist machine. In the global South, especially in Africa, where the state has done much less to take on the costs of social reproduction and care, the lack of preparedness to manage the pandemic has, has been exposed through the lack of many public services, transport, housing, water and sanitation, food security, unemployment, insurance or social security. The absence of this social infra infrastructure forced heavy lockdowns, which in turn have increased the economic cost of the pandemic um, at the domestic level. But in, in addition to attending to questions of care and social reproduction, feminists have also analyzed the issue of social depletion, which is similar to uh, environmental depletion. What happens when care systems have been depleted of the resources and capacities to do their jobs, which is to sustain human beings? What happens when in addition to withdrawal of the state and public support for care mm -hmm. systems, informal and community or kinship networks which rely on women's unpaid labor can no longer cope? That's my starter. Um, uh, my, that, that's my timer, sorry. Um, so rebuilding after the pandemic needs to address these issues, moving away from cycles of extraction and depletion to cycles of mitigation, replenishment and support. I'm borrowing this from um, 
Shireen Rai's uh, theories around uh, theorizing around social depletion. So we must all agree that just as capitalism is a terrible economic model, cis hetero patriarchy is a very bad leadership model and both of them have to go. Uh, just a final few words around um, uh, COVID-19 uh, and Africa. The, um, we've, uh, there's been an African feminist post-COVID recovery statement that has circulated and has been addressing the issue of financing post-COVID recovery, but also the need for African countries to regain policy autonomy and sovereignty. Recovery must be feminist, it must be social and e equitable, it must be local and locally owned, designed, it must be climate just, sustainable. It must be led by people in the state and not by the private sector or philanthropic capitalism. And it must be financed through Africa's own wealth, um, whether this be through uh, appropriate systems of taxations, uh, limiting illicit financial flows and capital flights. And it must reject the IMF and World Bank um, austerity equals growth recipe and conditionalities. But at the level of public policy, COVID-19 has exposed once again the vacuum, of the, the vacuum in policy autonomy in Africa. COVID responses have been a combination of ill-adapted cut and paste at the top, even though certainly um, we must acknowledge much of the in innovation that has been happening outside, um, outside the state framework and at, at community level. Governments have only been able to suppress the spread of the pandemic through lockdowns, but we are not seeing convincing plans for a full reopening. The same ills that plagued the first pandemic response remain intact. Yes, there has been much collaboration and it's welcome around the COVID-10 pandemic, but the 54 countries of the continent have not, developed a, have not developed a bold project for rethinking African development beyond the pandemic. We've had plans of action like Agenda 60, 2063, um, which is the AU global plan, but already it was launched in 2013. Um, in its first, in the seven out of 10 years, it's, the goals have not been achieved. And in fact, we have gone backwards. It's a model of a la carte planning. There are lots of things on the menu, but unfortunately what we pick and choose is prioritized not in the light of what is of importance to the African people or what is critical to do in the light of huge challenges ahead. It, what is prioritized is those elements that are important to global financial capital and the Washington consensus. We are still sticking, we are still in a, stuck in a mode of the theory of human development through trickle down, but wealth is not trickling down, it is being vacuumed out at an alarming rate. Um, just to conclude, uh, because my time is up, yes, we want, um, we want 2020 to be over, but I'm not sure there's much to suggest that 2021 will be any better. Um, so these issues are of great urgency. Um, there are huge questions to talk about in terms of COVID, uh, the reshaping and of the global political economy and the position of, positioning of the global South. And we do have to, um, put gender at the center of questions of um, how we reshape relations of land, labor, finance, technology, information, and, and knowledge, all those good old, good, good old uh, factor of produ production issues um, and power relations around those. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and I'll take the rest in questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nancy, for, for, for this uh, interesting presentation, and especially for drawing attention to the collapse in, in the divisions, the traditional divisions between the sites of production and reproduction, and the fact that this provides the opportunity to dream of a different way of understanding the reproduction of, of, of labor and of, of, of societies. But also for drawing attention to the fact that the progressive struggles against imperialism and militarism and environmental injustices need to include struggles against the heteropatriarchal neoliberal states and the fact that gender is not um, a soft issue but rather um, um, a central pillar of, of struggle for a just order 
Um, also, I, I want to underline the point you made about the importance of reclaiming policy autonomy, but also to move away from the uncritical adoption of prescriptions from elsewhere for the uh, uh, problems of the Global South. So thank you very much. And I'd now like to call on Nilanjana to take the floor. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thanks very much, Georgie. I want to thank you, um, like Nancy did, for putting us together. Uh, and uh, thank you to the Agrarian South Network and uh, the Sam Moyo Institute, as well as Action Aid India, for this, uh, for this fantastic sort of uh, discussion. And I hope that we'll have them, uh, that this is not the end, that this is just the beginning. Um, I, I was uh, asked to sort of speak to some of the responses, the impact and responses um, in the Asia region, region. And I just want to start off, uh, start off by saying that I am not, I don't feel particularly qualified to do so, but I'll just, I'll just say that um, the response has been very diverse um, in, um, in the Asia region. Uh, in many countries, there has been a com comprehensive public health and economic resilience and recovery. Um, uh, the response is uh, um, designed around that, at least on paper, uh, including, of course, uh, we know of the case of Vietnam, South Korea, China, Thailand, Singapore, etc. Even uh, even in South Asia, there has even though in South Asia the, the response to COVID has been quite patchy. Um, India, minus Kerala, of course, I'm sure that you've all heard about um, uh, how the Kerala sort of state response has been um, uh, quite stellar. Um, uh, India has stuck out as a sore thumb uh, with now the second highest uh, caseload in the world, the most brutal lockdown announced uh, with only four hours notice, reminiscent of the disastrous demonetization experiment several years ago by the same government, and with a meager fiscal stimulus uh, package, which is estimated to be one of the lowest in the world, um, the dismantling of, uh, um, of rights-based um, uh, programs such as the rural employment uh, guarantee, uh, the food distribution system, uh, system um, the fiscal stance that the government has taken, and a lot has been written about this um, in India as well as in uh, international press, because of course in India, um, there's been plenty written about this since the beginning of the, the, uh, the most brutal lockdown in the world. Um, what, is, what is important, however, is that um, this, this response is actually just a manifestation of underlying conditions um, similar to countries and the underlying conditions that are similar to countries which have the highest caseloads, Brazil, um, UK, US, and the weakest responses. And the underlying condition is that of uh, neoliberal orthodoxy. In India, since 1990s, early 1990s, so for 30 years now since the debt crisis, um, uh, India has uh, uh, demonstrated a bipartisan uh, and uh, almost religious adherence to neoliberalism uh, with the dismantling of public goods, assets and services, the evisceration of state capacity, and therefore state accountability to fulfill its most fundamental obligations, the shredding of the social contract, however inadequate, and the betrayal of the promises of social and economic rights, equality, justice, and progress of the post-independent development state, even though the post-independent development state was a heteropatriarchal state, but it had some, it's had, had some guarantees for its, its people, um, as well as the realignment of ge geopolitical interests and a betrayal of, uh, of Southern internationalism. Um, the COVID response in India is uh, an on steroid version of the pre-COVID agenda. Um, so this government has opened up multiple fronts, uh, including a ramped up demonization of Muslims, minorities, and Dalits, um, a demonization of and, and um, slapping of anti-terrorism charges around feminist, against feminist activists, unionists, lawyers, and academics, 
all of whom were part of uh, the glorious multi-ethnic, multi-caste pan-Indian movement against the citizenship amendment law, which was unconstitutional and uh, fundamentally, um, fundamentally uh, anti-Muslim. Um, the India case like Brazil, US, UK is instructive because the pre uh, 2008 era of progressive neoliberalism, as, it's, as it, as it uh, is called, has been replaced by an unshakable compact between neoliberalism and fascism. Uh, although some people uh, still like to use the uh, term proto-fascism, but I think we can, we can retire that uh, prefix. Uh, what has been on the IMF and the World Bank agenda uh, for the country for the last 30 years uh, since that debt crisis has is being faithfully rolled out. Um, so the dilution of environmental protections, the dismantling of labor laws, and privatization, privatization, privatization of public assets, public enterprises, public banks, um, and, um, and public higher education, uh, all, all of them are up for <clears throat> a program for, uh, in, in, uh, in what is going to look like um, massive transfer of wealth, public wealth to private hands. Um, the gendered impacts of COVID, uh, I think um, this has been, and Archana, I'm sure, is going to speak to this as well. You know, so I'm just going to quickly sort of do a summary of it. Women workers in the informal economy are hit once again. Once again, after demonetization, it's almost like the government has decided that it wants to, um, it wants to replace, it wants to destroy the informal economy. Women health outreach and community workers bear the burden of contract, who bear the burden of contract tracing and response, COVID response, aren't even considered workers, but as volunteers, uh, and they aren't paid minimum wage and lack, of, and lack social security. Um, and they are literally the backbone, what, we, what, what are known as ASHA workers, are literally the backbone of the public health system in India. Um, women workers in the garment industry are facing massive job losses as multinationals have canceled orders and refused to pay them. Uh, and you would have all seen uh, pictures from Bangalore of garment work, women garment workers um, protesting against the, uh, the cancellation of orders. Um, unpaid care and domestic work uh, and the pay and patriarchy's means of policing it. And I, I think that it's really important to um, sort of state that, that gender-based violence and domestic intimate partner violence and domestic violence is patriarchy's way of policing unpaid care and domestic work have increased and that's not unlike the rest of the world. Um, even as we talk about COVID being an X-ray to the many injustices of capitalism, we often fail to notice this, that neoliberal capitalism is anti-women, anti-queer, anti-feminist, uh, is as anti-women, anti-queer, and anti-feminist as right-wing fundamentalism, and both collude to prop up the heteronormative family unit, um, which keeps women in their place uh, to be subservient to cis-heteropatriarchy and to expend free reproductive labor to subsidize capitalism. And I think Nancy has spoken um, quite well to this. Um, while the former is a matter of matter well understood, uh, the latter, so patriarchy is a, a, a matter well understood, the latter, the question of social reproduction isn't mainstream yet. Uh, women's unpaid care and domestic work is keeping a broken, flailing, unsustainable, planet destroying, unjust and neocolonial system afloat uh, as states withdraw, uh, cut spending, deregulate and privatize, women pick up the pieces caring, healing, walking miles to collect firewood and water, producing food. Women are the remaining social protection system when states have broken the social contract with people. Uh, this unpaid labor comes not only at the cost of women, uh, their access to rights to health, to education, to paid work, let alone decent work. It comes at the cost of all struggles against neoliberalism uh, because without a central attention to women's unpaid labor, um, a debt um, and, a, uh, and um, a recognition of the debt that needs to be repaid to women for social reproduction, no movement will win the struggle against neoliberal capitalism. Um, and, and the fact is that international financial institutions, so IMF and the World Bank, 
uh, know this, know that un women's unpaid labor keeps neoliberalism afloat. The question is why don't progressive movements? Um, and uh, IFIs, especially since the 2008 crisis, uh, began their, um, you know, what Andrea Cornwall called uh, linguistic kleptomania, which is just, um, just appropriating progressive language of progressive movements and feminist movements and um, eva evacuating any polit political meaning of uh, those terms and, uh, you know, using those terms to further um, the neoliberal capture. Um, so post-2008 began, began the neoliberal capture of feminist concerns around questions of the care economy, women's work, labor rights, workforce participation, gender pay gap, etc. IMF uh, and the World Bank, uh, riding on the successes of the Asian miracle, began to persuade countries to corral more and more women in sweatshops, in low-paid uh, jobs with little social protection, uh, without labor rights, uh, including a protection against gender-based violence, um, uh, sub women being subjected to forced pregnancy tests, and in some cases, even forced uh, abortion. Um, after destroying industrial policy uh, making, IFIs, IMF and the World Bank, and uh, other multilateral uh, development banks pushed the export-driven model we saw profiteering literally off the backs of women in the global south. Um, secondly, even as they acknowledge uh, women's greater responsibility for unpaid care and domestic work, they refuse to acknowledge, let alone reverse the role of their own politics of uh, policies of austerity and privatization. Um, that has uh, played a massive part historically and continues to do so uh, in tripling, doubling and tripling women's uh, work burden. Um, the fact uh, is that the IMF and the World Bank won't and can't acknowledge um, uh, the, fact, uh, the, the fact that women's unpaid labor is keeping the system afloat, uh, because once they do, um, you know, the, the system collapses. Um, and, and even when they do acknowledge women's unpaid care uh, and domestic work, their solution is always a false solution, which is sharing responsibility between men and uh, women. And of course, there isn't, uh, you know, one has to, one has to acknowledge uh, patriarchy's role in the gender division of labor. Uh, but the fact is, uh, as long as women's unpaid care and domestic work remains privatized, it's going to remain gendered. Uh, so it has to be, the state has to compensate uh, uh, women, redistribute unpaid care and domestic work and compensate women for uh, their reproductive debt. Um, in Asia, I think uh, the two pieces, uh, you know, the sweatshop feminism, which is pushing off this export oriented growth model uh, on different parts of Asia, uh, especially after dismantling the industrial, industrial policy making. Uh, and the uh, twinning of that with, um, you know, the, the, the exporting of care workers from Asia. So there's actually a formalization of um, the global uh, care chain where women from Asia are uh, even by their own governments, even trained to become care workers and then are, uh, are exported to the global north and their remittances um, come back. Um, and um, and subsidize their economies um, in in Asia. So there there is actually a formalization of this export of uh, women's unpaid care and domestic work from Asia. Um, uh, there I did I did want to speak to uh, uh, quickly uh, feminists resisting um, this sort of you know um, uh, this corporate capture IMF and the World Bank and their agenda, especially. Um, their agenda of, uh, of, of capturing and defanging feminist struggles, um, the, the, the questions around debt, tax, climate change. Um, they're in, in Asia, APWLD, uh, you would know Asia Pacific Women Law and Development the organization, the network, uh, which has members all across the Asia Pacific region. Uh, APMDD, the Asia Pacific Movement on Debt and Development, um, are all uh, they all work on trade agreements, resisting trade agreements uh, that will um, that will privatize public services or deregulate labor or deregulate regulate environmental protection on tax 
on uh, on debt um, and um, there is there is a, a all women work campaign statement that speaks to some of the issues that we're talking about right now uh, and it's sort of what what is really interesting about the uh, statement and I'll just post it in the chat box is that it it sort of speaks to changing the narrative and that is uh, what we have to do in the future which is changing the narrative of who owes what uh, what work is valuable, um, et cetera. Um, I, I think Nancy has already sort of spoken to this in, in terms of the futures, South-South uh, solidarity and gender as being um, a, a centralization of, not a centralization, but centering of uh, unpaid, um, of care economy, care infrastructure and care work in all progressive movements. A popular movement against IFIs, we had this 25 years ago when we said 50 years is enough, and now we're in uh, 75 years and we're still saying 75 years is enough. So a popular movement around um, G20, World Bank, IMF, uh, World Economic Forum, and, uh, and a build, rebuilding of uh, countervailing power um, uh, and counter hegemonic power. Uh, so, um, you know, what about the G77? Nobody talks about the G77 anymore. Uh, we are all going to G20 for our claims making, uh, except for maybe the climate movement. Nobody else talks about the G77. Um, so, see, these are some of the sort of ideas that I hope we can explore in the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nila. Um, there are three points you, you made that I thought that we should um, underline. And one of them has to do with the importance of understanding the underlining conditions of the neoliberal orthodoxes, particularly in this present moment in its alliance with, um, with, with fascism. And the fact that it has many features, such as the retreat of the state, the shredding of the social contract, rampant market fundamentalisms and the retreat from South-South uh, internationalism. And the fact that this is what um, is resulting in cyclical crises and the structural inequalities um, that we see today. The second point has to do with your detailing of the costs of unpaid labor, but also the grim reality of women's paid labor as casual poorly paid workers and the fact that this is doubling and tripling their, their, their work burdens. And last but not least, um, looking at women's resistance, but also the corporate capture and defanging of, of their struggles, and therefore the need to change the narrative of who owns what and what work is valuable. And, 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 and basically a movement to resuscitate our South-South networks and, and, and other struggles. So thank you um, very much. I'd now like to call Gabriella to make her intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dodi, and thank you ev everyone for the invite. Uh, so to keep the um, analysis that my colleagues are making, uh, we see that the coronavirus did not create much news. It actually increased uh, some structural and deep problems that we need to address. Uh, coronavirus crisis was very overwhelming for Latin America economies because it affected the informal work vital for the Latin American economy. Sorry, <laughs> that can be demonstrated by the numbers uh, that shows from Cepal that shows a decrease of 9.1 in the GPD of the region, and uh, are very connected to uh, a huge. Um, unemployment that we are reaching. We are uh, reaching historic records when it comes to employment. We are witnessing a great cohesion of jobs in the Latin America. Uh, CEPAL is, is saying that Latin America will hit 13.5% of unemployment in the end of 2020, which means talking about 44.1 million of unemployed people. This represents an increase of almost 18 million of unemployed people in relation of the levels of 2011, where we had about 26 million of people unemployed. 
In this context, women have been severely affected for a number of reasons. Women are occupying some of the sectors of activity that are severely affected by the crisis, such as, for example, hotels, restaurants, domestic service. They have a higher informality rate than men. And to give you an idea, according to CEPAL, 11.4% of women in Latin America are engaged to paid domestic work. And 77.5% of these people are informal workers. So uh, another point that uh, make really complex the situation of women is the school. Since March, schools have been closed and this caused a huge increase of the care work carried out by women. We are talking about at least 113 millions of children who are inside their homes. Women uh, and the women who manage to keep their jobs in this crisis, they are facing great difficulties to reconcile the working hours and the domestic work. Uh, in Brazil, we have been facing economic and political problems since at least 2013. And actually, we never. I think we lost like Gabriela. Gabriela has um, friends were completely complimented. Sorry? Are you okay? Yes. For a while you were off. So I'm glad uh, you're fine. Okay. Please continue. We can hear you uh, now. Okay, sorry. So I was saying that in Brazil, we have been facing economic and political problems since at least 2013. And since the early of 2000, the left center governments in, in Brazil, especially, were using the conditional cash, cash transfer policies, complemented with investments in universal and free health and education. And that allowed Brazil to experience social advances in reducing inequalities for many years. With uh, Dilma's impeachment in a COPE, we see the rise of neoliberal projects taking space again, now next to fascism from the figure of Jair Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro's agenda is composed of a, a very important marriage between uh, conservatism and neoliberalism, which can be summarized by two ministerial figures, Damaris, uh, an evangelical minister, and she's part of, she's minister from Women, Family, and Human Rights, which shows the perspective of this government for human rights. And we, and the banking and economist, Paulo Guedes, which is a minister of economics. The agenda of Bolsonaro and Paulo Guedes was limited by the concrete reality, which demand more distributive policies. Last year, Bolsonaro froze Bolsa Familia budget in the poor city. But uh, during this crisis, after a great and initial resistance, the Brazilian government uh, implemented an emergency income policy around $110, uh, considering the, cur the currency. And it was for families in situation of social vulnerability. Uh, this uh, emergency policy uh, benefit the women who, with children and they receive uh, the double of the benefit, which was very important because the women were very uh, impacted by the crisis. But the implementation of the policy has several troubles because the request of the benefit is started in an app and we are talking about a country where people don't have access, full access to internet. So especially people from communities that they don't have uh, access to good internet, they had a lot of problems uh, in the application to receive the benefit. And uh, I believe it's important that we, we must to careful carefully analyze the movement of expansion of income transfers 
and deep in this discussion because uh, it seems that the neoliberal states, they are appropriating this policy in order to transfer responsibility for the management of the crisis to the families. Um, they, uh, they are using this benefit to uh, hide the cuts that they are doing in very important sectors of economy as health system, education system. Um, so in that sense, I believe this, the challenge are many and we, it's necessary that we ensure that the cash transfer policies are coupled with massive state investments, especially in areas which affect the social reproduction. Uh, it's important to give attention of the withdrawal of rights that has been taking place in this period uh, as an example of the land uh, and the environment question, which they are uh, enjoying this moment that people cannot protest to burning the, 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 the land, the forest, to make, uh, to take the land from the occupations as MSCT. So in, uh, to end, I want to, 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 to bring, um, in the beginning of the coronavirus, the president of Brazil, he said, each family must take care of its el elderly person. And this phrase, to some extent, it's very important to understand the individualization and the transfer of responsibility that these new neoliberal governments want to make they want to make the family's response to manage this, this crisis. Uh, and that's the, the mailing reflection I want to, to let. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gabriela, for, for that um, really interesting uh, presentation. I was especially <clears throat> struck by the, your, your statistics and how it shows the ways in which COVID has deepened the structural character of the crisis. And the fact that you show very clearly that the most affected areas of the crisis are also the parts of the economy where women predominate as workers, the hotels, the restaurants, and, and domestic services. And also your points about the school closures and their effects on women who work. The fact that they are now grappling with the uh, challenges of reconciling the, the home and the work. Most importantly is the points you make about the, 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 the social protection system. The fact that it is the same government that froze Bossa Familia, which has now returned to an emergency income support policy and, and that although women are privileged in this policy, it also represents a transfer of the responsibility for managing the crisis and to, to, to the family and all the ideologies that follow, which all these things about the elderly and, and, and so on. And I think this really resonates in many African countries. So for example, in a place like Ghana, water subsidies and electricity subsidies ostensibly directed at poor people do not reach them because you need a meter, a, a, a meter to be able to access your water subsidy and your electricity subsidy. And most of the poor do not have water meters, even those who pay uh, water bills. So I think it's very important for us to bring a feminist lens to, 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 to some of these uh, processes that look like uh, they, 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 they are supposed to benefit women and to actually see who is benefiting. I also thought that your point about um, the, 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 the land and environmental questions raised by um, this crisis, basically governments hiding behind the crisis to engage in massive acts of dispossession through burning the Amazon and so on were really critical issues. So thank you very much for bringing these to, to, to this conversation, Gabriela. I now would like to call on Achana, last but not least, to make her, her intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Georgie. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, say that uh, a lot has already been said about some of the issues <clears throat> that uh, sort of resonate 
with uh, a lot of uh, common thinking on the relationship between capitalism and patriarchy and the way in which it has uh, uh, sort of manifested itself in the pandemic times. Uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, while agreeing with a lot of what has been said, I'd like to introduce some issues which, uh, which would sort of complicate our understanding a little more about the relationship between class power, capitalism, and patriarchy. And I'd like to submit to you uh, from my experience with working with ordinary women over many decades and also trying to organize them, I think uh, I'd like to submit to you that uh, the ways in which patriarchy has read its head and is embedded within the changing social relations of production. Capitalism is a big black box with different layers of domination and different layers of the way in which certain social reproductive aspects embed themselves in it and sort of articulate their presence also. So the ways in which social reproduction itself has been reconfigured and therefore patriarchy itself has been reconfigured by the reinvention and re uh, uh, sort of consolidation of capitalism under every stage of capitalism is something that should be recognized by us more seriously because the way in which we recognize the methods by which patriarchy is rearing its head, and it's not always the same patriarchy that existed maybe 40 years ago, which the progressive movement fought by breaking the, uh, uh, by breaking the uh, sort of uh, back of landlordism and releasing some forces of emancipation which is not to say that all patriarchy within the progressive movement had gone by way. Yeah, so uh, the way in which it rears its head under different conditions of production and under, the, under differing macroeconomic situations needs to be recognized if we are to formulate our strategies against patriarchy and work towards the socialization of social reproduction itself. Because I think everybody would agree that without the socialization of social reproduction, we are always going to have this non-recognition of unpaid work. And also we are going to have a situation where even the paid work of women is not recognized properly or uh, the rights of women are not recognized. And why only women? Even the rights of the most historically deprived groups are not recognized under this system. Uh, are not recognized under the system. And the women in those uh, social groups are in fact, uh, out of my own uh, work, I can tell you that even the women in those groups may face greater disadvantage, but their problems are different from, but their uh, problems are different uh, from the women of my class or the women of the uh, 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 higher class. So the point that I'm trying to make is uh, simple and I've actually been making it for some time now that the relationship between class power, the manifestation of class power and patriarchy is quite, uh, is quite complicated and different. And unless we as women's rights activists don't recognize that our ways of organizing 
are going to lag behind and are already lagging behind from what we see on the uh, ground. I'll tell you why I'm saying this. I was reading the ILO report on the Global Commission on the Future of Work. And one of the first things that it said was gender equality begins at home. And we must recognize unpaid care work in order to address the problem of gender equality, which is crucial to address the problem of uh, the employment crisis today. Now I wonder why an organization like that, which has actually given us many things to be happy about also, is making this statement as this at this juncture, at this juncture. And when I think about it more, you know, uh, we are seeing in many of the developing countries a historical low in the uh, paid work participation rates of women. We are seeing historical lows in this even before the pandemic. And even before the pandemic and now after the pandemic, the chorus from work from home to uh, the chorus that we should be working from home has gone up. The chorus has just increased to a really large extent and now technology is being used as a discourse and a method of preventing organization. We are finding this in our university system itself that technology is being used as a method of preventing political organization. And this method, uh, so work from home, what does it mean? It basically means that the ways in which we were organizing women workers earlier, where we were arguing that they should get access to paid decent work, the basis for that demand is being changed at a very, uh, at a very fast pace. And therefore, we are going to have a situation where work from home for women is going to be justified through a discourse where we are arguing that, you know, anyway, women have too much burden of social reproduction, so they should, uh, uh, so they will have flexibility in timings. That's one thing. The second thing is they will retain their autonomy. You know, there's a lot being said in this report about time sovereignty. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot being said about time sovereignty. And when I talk about time sovereignty, I wonder how does this sit with the fact that in most countries, the working hours are being extended from eight to 12 hours. And we are also now coming out with reports which say that people want to work more. That people want to work more, that women want to work more. That self-employed women, they want to work for 10 hours more in the week. Why is this the case? This is the case because the cost of social reproduction, whether it's unpaid or whether it depends on the commodification of social reproduction is going up to a very great extent. And people feel the need to work more and more and more. And that has been given the name of what we call autonomy. Now, time sovereignty flexibility. So, you know, the uh, discourses that we use in terms of time sovereignty, in terms of, you know, uh, time poverty of women, no time to relax, the time use service that we did earlier, and all those, that, that whole language has been incorporated. 
that whole language has been incorporated within uh, our framework. So I think we have to also start thinking about our language a bit. What kind of language uh, do we use to organize resistance? We should start thinking about that as well, because unless we think about that language, and we found this in even in the case of most oppressed uh, uh, communities like the Dalits and the Adivasis and all, if you look at the discourse as it developed in community terms, in other terms, it got incorporated within the discourse of the IMF World Bank also. So I think we have to be a little careful how we place the problem and at which stage we place it. Now, this brings me to my third and maybe uh, if I have five minutes, maybe, uh, uh, maybe uh, my final point, uh, because I'm just trying to uh, 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 flag a few uh, issues. Uh, so this brings me to my final point. What sort of strategies do we adopt and how do we distinguish between movements with which whom we want to align? Yeah, I don't think we can put all movements in a black box. The women's movement has a very long history and the women's anti-colonial struggle also has a uh, has a very long history about which I can talk if there are some questions. So uh, I just want to say that the defense of certain principles of paid work cannot be carried out by women themselves. They'll have to find allies, not only within the feminist movement, but outside the feminist movement also. At the same time, that alliance will also help us to put pressure within working class movements in order to sort of help to transform their character. And I think, uh, 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 you know, it's not as if those, uh, the perceptions of those movements have remained the same. In fact, there has been a lot of reconfiguration of the agenda about which uh, uh, I could uh, sort of uh, talk a bit later because I think I have to wind up now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Achana, for, for these really um, interesting insights. I especially want to draw attention to the fact that you highlight the relations between class power and, and patriarchy and make the point that the changes in expression of patriarchal power are related to different types of economic systems and the need to be cognizant um, of, of that. I especially want to draw attention to the fact that you identify the socialization of social reproduction as a critical agenda. And the fact that this ensures that um, the women who are most deprived and as well as other deprived social groups um, are, are seen as critical for, 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 um, the, uh, for, for the struggle that we wage. And so um, I think we would all agree that it's important to differentiate the problems of the most disadvantaged of women from those of, 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 of middle-class women as we analyze um, um, this current uh, con conjuncture. And um, I thought that your, your last point about the historical loss in women's paid work um, uh, participation, plus the use of technologies to encourage people to work at home and its implications were particularly important because I think what you draw attention to the disorganization of, of the organization of women and also the demands that they can make for, um, for, 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 for care work and also the need to interrogate more the, 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 the co-optation of progressive language in time use work that feminists have done. And basically the sanitization of terms such as flexibility, time sovereignty and so on. And the fact that we really need to understand this language as, as, as part of our resistance were very, very critical points. And last but not least, 
the need for alliances with progressive movements that the feminist movements have to make, both in order to widen uh, 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 the aperture of our struggles, but also to help to transform those movements. So thank you very much for, for, for um, a, 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 an illuminating um, set of presentations in such um, a short space of time. And with this, I want to thank all four panelists um, it has been tremendous, the agenda that you've placed before us. And so now it's time for questions and answers. And we already have some questions which have come to us from, um, from, 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 from Facebook and, and from, um, from Zoom. So I, I just want to, um, to, to, to mention uh, so, some of the, 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 the questions. The very first question came from a Rajiv Grover who says, why are we, why always women suffering? Not only this pandemic, but also throughout every second of life, more than men. And, and there are two question marks at the end of it. So I don't know whether this is a complaint about our continuous focus on, 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 on the suffering of women. Um, the second question that we have comes from Asmal Diallo. What future can you prospect for women in third world countries after COVID-19? The third question comes from Marion Midai, and it's what role do you think white supremacy plays in maintaining the status quo? The fourth question comes from Sukhdev Singh Sohal. Do you think that COVID-19 is becoming a shield to further marginalize the position of women? Um, and another question comes from Yogesh Sharma. Women's empowerment, is that the only solution or are other approaches uh, re re required? And last but not least is um, a question which says, is the Caribbean included in the South-South analysis Separate references speak primarily to Latin American countries. Please provide some context and include a, a contact for Gabriel in Brazil. Thank you. So these, these are some of the, 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 the first questions uh, we've, we've, we've received. Um, I think this is um, a bit to ask our panelists to reflect on um, as they wish. And, and can we have... Um, and short reflections because there's another set of questions. I, I don't want to inundate you with, with, with all the questions that have been asked so far. So if you can speak to these ones, we will move to a second round of questions um, after that. Thank you. So maybe you, you can take them in the order in which you spoke and if, and answer those questions that, uh, that strike you. I guess that means me, right? Yes, please, Nancy. Uh, Brief responses role, please, the role so of that we can get through the questions. Okay. Um, I think the presentation was trying to explain why women are always suffering and what the and what the function and purpose of that suffering is. Um, and the point is to understand that the, the, these, are not, these are not accidental. Um, um, the, the suffering is the cost of keeping a particular system of power in place. Um, so uh, the question around the role of white supremacy, I think you can see, again, you have a, a power system that is set to benefit certain types of people. Um, and if you look at who the billionaires right now are, you can probably see who, who is benefiting the most um, and who benefits down, that, that downstream. Um, it's not one, it, you know, the, it's, a, it's a hierarchy of power, which is racialized and gendered. Um, and so of course, it, it's, it's a white supremacy, white male privilege that gains the most out of it and has the most interest in keeping it intact. Um, and then what's the future for women after COVID? I, I, I think that's the question that's at play right now. 
Um, and that's the reason why we, we feel it, it, it's really important and critical to understand how gender relations are, are, have, to be, have, have to be part of a, a transformation and that we need to refuse the, the, invis the, the, the way the system has made these issues invisible in what functions. So as we're looking at solutions to, to, to take that whole social reproduction household um, sphere of um, production slash reproduction uh, um, is, is, is part of keeping the, the power system intact. Um, so if you fail to address that, you're already sowing the seeds of failure of future change. Thank you, Nancy. Nila? Thanks, Georgie. I, I think I will pick up the last, uh, the last question, um, which is the future of um, future of women and, and feminism. I think, I think this is something that we've had discussions about. I've been part of the sort of international, you know, women's women's movement, <clears throat> and I and I and I think that what uh, we have failed to do, and I include myself in that, the international women's movement has failed to do. Uh, is the is the sort of um, reconcile with uh, with the fact that our our, our biggest gains uh, as uh, biggest gains sort of uh, which are international human rights women's human rights agreements um, through the multilateral system um, coincided uh, of uh, and the gains were in the 90s coincided with uh, neoliberal ascendancy. Um, and if not growing um, uh, sort of stranglehold of neoliberalism on the global south. Um, and, I, and I think that as an international uh, sort of women's movement and a feminist movement, we haven't sort of uh, reconciled with that, uh, acknowledged that uh, and dealt with it. So that is something that uh, we, should, we should do uh, and we need to do, especially um, especially sort of, you know, um, as a nod to, but just not, a, not as a nod to, but a revival of black and third world feminism of um, the 60s and the 70s and socialist feminism of the 60s and the 70s. Um, I think uh, the, the, the rays of hope is that social reproduction is, um, has become part of sort of mainstream progressive movements conversation. So it's become a part, it's being acknowledged. Um, even social reproduction is, uh, is somewhat sort of uh, placed, uh, uh, placed social reproduction and care infrastructure. So care workers, care infrastructure, health, uh, uh, public health, public education, public transport, public housing. So care infrastructure and care workers are even being acknowledged or have been acknowledged as part of the global Green New Deal conversations. However, what's been missing is the South uh, piece. Um, so uh, even as there have been calls around internationalism, uh, are those internationalist calls really international? There have been calls around global Green New Deal. Are those calls really global? Uh, and where does the global South and the global South feminist sort of uh, peace come into those conversations. So I think that there are definitely, um, there, there are signs of hope that uh, social reproduction is becoming more and more um, something that is being acknowledged and talked about and even as a solution. Uh, but uh, there are still gaps that uh, we need to sort of fill. And, and, and the third thing is we, there are very progressive movements in feminist movements in the global South. Uh, but we are fragmented in that we are regionalized. Um, and our only connection um, across regions is being, uh, is being sort of navigated through the North. So the, the sort of South-South internationalism, and that's true of all, uh, almost all movements. It's not just uh, the feminist movement, but maybe more so for the feminist movement. Um, so the South-South internationalism is again, sort of, you know, not centered. Um, so I think that there are definitely things to do uh, and places to go, uh, but uh, there, there are ways of hope, uh, but we need to sort of um, uh, push the advance that agenda. Thank you very much, Nila. Gabriella. 
yeah, I will be very short. Uh, I think I'll speak about the women empowerment. I think uh, the political economy feminist approach uh, give, us, give us tools to not uh, fall in the neoliberal notion of empowerment. I believe the empowerment is a concept that is in dispute by neoliberalism and by the resistance. And we must to, uh, connect ourselves with the political economy dis discussions in order to understand the real power, to understand the real power and to question it. And so in order to empowerment and the future, I believe the future of, uh, of the women in the South is the struggle, the resistance, but also I see that we are uh, looking for the structure, looking for the institutions and, and trying to uh, assess it with another perspective. So I believe we, we must to be careful about empowerment notion because neoliberalism wants to, us to believe that if we have uh, one woman in a power position, then we are empowered. If we are buying products, then we are empowered. And to speak about empowerment when it comes to women is about the power relations that put us in the lower salaries, in the lower positions to the society. And then it, it is the system that hides our work that we made inside homes, the work of care, as we are saying. So it's important to look for empowerment and not fall, not fall in the liberal uh, um, place, but also we need to understand that to speak about the gender issue is also a power dispute. We are talking about how the power organized mm -hmm. in the society. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriela. Achana, please. So many of them are just sort of lost track. Um, but uh, uh, I'd like to just take uh, up on the conversation that is uh, taking place. I believe that uh, the post-pandemic work of the women's organizations, at least uh, I have some experience of India, has shown us that there are certain issues that are a common ground between the working class movement and the different women's organizations. The first issue, I think, and in which we achieved some success also, was the issue of food security and the way in which people self-organize themselves through different movements and, uh, 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 and, uh, and sort of accessed uh, basic amenities through, in fact, a working class uh, self-organization is instructive for our future strategies. The second thing that I want to state is that, you know, when we do a demand for universal social security or universal uh, public provisioning of public services, I think along with that demand, we also have to break the back of the new liberal and the fascist state by demanding a democratization of control over those common facilities. And I feel that reclaiming the public within, within the sphere of the movement is something that resonates with a wide spectrum of ideologies and it should not remain uh, a word, uh, uh, just a word basically. You know, safe public sector should not remain a word in developing and developed countries. It should mean that the control over pe of people who use it needs to be facilitated. So uh, we have to demand systems that democratize control and management 
of common facilities that already exist and that should exist even in the future, including things like childcare and all these other uh, types of public services that will be demanding. So we need to reclaim, if you like, a common and uh, uh, do that. But that fight cannot take place in a vacuum. You see, that fight also has to take place through alliances, not only internationally, but also within countries and within regions. Because the contexts are very specific. You know, one class of feminists is uh, talking a language that another uh, uh, women's organizations or who work with maybe very different social base do not understand. So a conversation within is also needed quite a lot, as much as a conversation in internationally, which may be actually a public policy conversation. But in terms of organization, we need an internal conversation and desperately so. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for those useful um, strategies. Um, I want to move to the second round of questions, and this will be the last round. Um, there's a question from Alice about the fact that there's an unprecedented worldwide increase in widow numbers due to many factors such as armed conflicts, migration, natural disasters, child marriage, and epidemics of disease, and now COVID. COVID is exposing and ex exacerbating the, the plight of widows and widows of all ages around the world. What can be done to address this? That's one. The second question comes from Singh Sohal. It says, please comment on the situation that under macho political dispensations of Trump in the US, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Modi in India and Putin in Russia, the people are having west of the COVID-19. The countries with women in leadership like New Zealand, Germany, Taiwan and Ireland are having control over the spread of COVID-19. Has due notice of this pattern been taken? The next question comes from Jifa Tovike. Um, how can the alternatives that feminist socialists and others have proposed get traction in neoliberal structures of the state, regional bodies, UN systems, etc.? What kinds of mobilization are required to advance the, uh, the strategies? Um, the next question comes from Grove Harris. What's the potential role of local currencies in valuing work on exchange basis circulating locally? I don't see government financially redressing the care economy and I think it, we need other transition solutions. Um, the next question is about the American elections. With the American elections, what can we expect from the economic situation in Brazil? Another question is, are there similarities in the challenges women in the global South face during COVID-19? What concrete solutions do the panelists suggest based on the realities of each country? Then another question from Punami Basu, what role the state and society can play, especially in the minority communities in the third world to raise awareness of gender equality? Will the education sector become key, but then most do not have access to internet? A question from Isa Shivji. While I agree with all the antis, anti-capitalism, anti-neoliberalism, anti-patriarchy, my basic, my biggest concern is how do we identify the strategic node where the most significant antis converge and which would help us to construct an alternative progressive narrative and discourse. Now we know that capitalism is characterized by a series of dichotomies, most based on the dichotomy division between the public and the private. So production at the workplace is public while social reproduction in the patriarchal family is private. Now, how do we descend this dichotomy in our narrative? and discourse and make it common sense, i.e. make it hegemonic. I want to suggest, and I'd like panelists to reflect on this, that the idea of commons, both traditional land, resources, 
underground and overground water, and the new commons, public goods such as education, health, childcare, and sanitation it would be useful. Wouldn't the struggle for reclaiming the commons help us to transcend the divide between social reproduction and production? Another question from Utam Charan Hotta is that women in the domestic service It's a great issue. And women's exploitation in domestic work is, oh. Sorry about that. My, my, my messages keep on jumping. Women in exploitation in domestic service is rising. COVID-19 has taught all how to manage without paid women domestic service. Shouldn't governments work towards enhancing the dignity of women in the social sector? suggest measures from Damien Lobos. In Latin America, the context of the pandemic has made possible the emergence of income policies towards the popular sectors. In many cases, they are the first to experience a massive, pro the they are the first experience of massive programs of this type. It seems we're heading towards their consolidation in the post pandemic period as a policy of economic reactivation. What can be done to redirect these experiences towards feminist uh, agendas? I'd now like, also like to call on Twinkle Sea-Watch to ask her question before we go, we go to the panelists. Hi, good evening from India. Good evening. Yeah, thank you so much for the wonderful session. I just uh, posted my comment. I actually wanted to comment. Uh, and uh, you know how uh, in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, taking forward Archana's argument about relation of class power and patriarchy, and then relating it to the judicial state, I just wanted to comment about you know how uh, in building strategies and organizing, uh, maybe we are actually lagging behind. So, uh, for instance, how Indian judiciary is working right now, it is putting up very regressive judgments. And the pattern is very much similar globally, which is where uh, I feel that the international solidarity, in a sense, also needs to pitch in. So, uh, basically, this is about how our existing laws are going unchecked. And additionally, again, uh, in global, uh, global North and global South, how there has been absence of support systems, especially during the period of lockdown. So uh, maybe in Europe, some countries, uh, shelter houses were provided by the government, but that kind of support uh, also from the uh, civil society organizations was not very much uh, was, uh, you know, available at the ground. So uh, that is how, I mean, when uh, Nancy was talking about depletion of resources, that is how I related it in the given uh, context in terms of how, uh, you know, there are resources, but uh, we are not uh, actually able to utilize it. Uh, yeah, that was my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Twinkle, for, for, for that insight. I'd now like to turn to our panelists to make the, the, their responses. I know the questions are overwhelming. There are many of them. I thought I should read all of them out so that we get a sense of what... Um, concerns our audience in, in, in this, in this um, webinar. So please, um, maybe we can, we can start in the same order as we, we started the last time from, from Nancy. Um, there was a question about widows. I mean, that's quite, it's, it's important in terms of talking about systems of social protection and social security, how they're gendered, access to resources, because um, part of widowhood often accompanies a, a, a loss of, of, um, of access to resources in rural areas that would be uh, land in urban areas that can be housing. Um, so it, it, it can be extremely, it, it's an ex, it can be an extremely traumatic experience. Um, but, but this is why the whole, the questions of, of, of having in place uh, social policies, social protection um, that deal that, 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 uh, that both and protecting rights, of course, because uh, 
um, need to be need to be in place to deal with shocks um, and and traumas that that we all face um, um, uh, across the road. Um, the, the, the bridging the com uh, reclaiming the commons and, and bridging the sites between uh, social and so um, social reproduction and production uh, I, that um, I think that's part of the point that we're we're trying to make is 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 that often the the one is made invisible and the other is more visible and we only deal with the one side we don't deal with the both but but part of that conversation is also about sort of global public goods, the commons, things that we all depend on, and the refusal to say that certain things can be privatized for profit. Um, um, well, of course, women's unpaid labor is also socialized for profit. <laughs> um, but, but those kinds of systems have to change. And we have to also understand that we do have, um, you know, that, that we all benefit from, from common resources and they, and, and, and they must be shared uh, equitably uh, in that context. Um, there was a question about local currencies, uh, just maybe to highlight, I think, uh, led from West Africa, there's some initiatives around monetary economics sovereignty, and that's where you have issues around what kind of fiscal space do governments have. So if you have your own currency, you have more fiscal space, but under the sort of austerity World Bank IMF programs, fiscal space for governments to expand the money supply in order to respond to emergencies is limited. So monetary so sovereignty becomes quite important in terms of having fiscal responses to, um, to crises and, and disasters. Um, one small question on women and men leadership. Uh, it's come up, a, a, a quick theory to, to finish. Um, yeah, there has been that, that I, 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 my, my idea is that maybe societies that A, are more gender equitable because they put in place those systems, um, that are that are more open to women's political participation um, collectively um, have are, are likely to be better in terms of their their respond responding. So it's not so much just the fact that um, you know a woman leader is in place, although of course we we welcome we welcome that. Um, but but if if uh, those women leaders can a be unshackled from patriarchal politi politics. Um, and and live and are in societies and governance frameworks that um, value equity um, and social protection, then they're going to be better at at responding. Um, and there was one question directed to me on uh, what could governments have done on up instead of lockdown. The problem with the lockdown was it was a panic response. There was no other response because there were there were there were there was no social infrastructure to actually have a, a rational way of dealing with the pandemic, including even governments knowing where people are in the informal sector, are they registered for formal social security? So you have to have this panic lockdown response rather than an ordered response, even in Africa where figures were very low, we just had to lock down because there was no other way of responding to the pandemic or to high numbers of sick people if that were to happen. So, so that it was the pre-existing conditions that made the lockdown necessary, whereas a different set of um, conditions in place could have allowed for a more um, calibrated response. I'll just stop there. Um, I, I'll pick up a couple, yeah, Georgie, uh, I'll yeah. pick up a couple as well. Um, so I think, yeah, just to sort of um, the what kind of mobilizations are required. And I think there was also a reference to the multilateral system. Um, so at different levels, uh, I, I don't think that we spoke about this, uh, but um, this year, actually, uh, before, uh, before the pandemic, um, there was the women's global strike, uh, the first year of the women's global strike, which was the withdrawal of paid and unpaid work. And I think that kind of mobilization and the solidarity with the women's global strike is really important because um, until we withdraw um, our unpaid uh, labor, uh, it is, uh, it is you know, not going to be recognized. So that was the sort of um, as well as paid labor. So, and in, in some countries, what they said was withdraw consumption as well. So it, it sort of took the shape, it took different shapes in different parts of the world. And, um, 
And that's the kind of mobilization that can, uh, if more and more people join, that that's the kind of mobilization that can um, that can really uh, be powerful. At the UN, um, at the UN, I, I think the important piece is that the multilateral system is under attack and has been under attack. Uh, and has been, you know, the whole development agenda has been captured by corporates, uh, as well as right wing sort of, you know, the gen anti gender um, uh, fundamentalists uh, at different the human rights system, uh, uh, the UN itself, uh, it, it the UN Secretary General, who who is a progressive or who also says he's a progressive and a feminist, entered uh, signed an MOU with the World Economic Forum. Uh, there are, uh, you know, multiple examples of how the UN is being captured by private, um, the private sector. But at the same time, there are parallel um, structures and um, parallel sort of structures that are being put up, whether it's the World Economic Forum or it's the G20, where, um, you know, where we are encouraged to do our claims making uh, instead of with governments. Um, and the multilateral system. So there is a there is a very um, clear uh, danger to the multilateral system, where a lot of um, you know women's rights, uh, as well as other other human rights um, instruments, are um, are enshrined. Um, so that that kind of mobilization of of um, uh, of protecting that multilateral space is important as well, while recognizing its inadequacies. Uh, on is is a uh, is a question. I think it's a really. I think what I pick up from that is the question of so how neoliberalism is common sense and how do we build another common sense? Uh, and I think that that is really critical. And that is I what I see. And this is why the cross continental conversations are really important. Um, what I see is in Latin America or wide parts of Latin America. Um, uh, there are conversations. There are conversations about the collaboration between or collusion between patriarchy, colonialism, um, cis heteropatriarchy, colonialism, capitalism, um, and the destruction of the environment uh, and indigenous people. And it's almost it's almost like it's common sense. It's not. Uh, everyday common sense, but it's almost like it's common sense, much more so than at least the region that I am in. Uh, and I think that 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 kind of mobilization that happens in different parts of the world, in different parts of the South, but also uh, people of color and Black people in the and Indigenous people in the North, um, we do need to learn from each other. And how do we sort of build this countervailing power? So I, that's the piece that I wanted to pick up from that uh, that question. Um, and the domestic women and domestic work, I think the International Federation of Women um, Domestic Workers has sort of, you know, said over and over again, the kind of job losses um, that domestic workers across the world are facing because of the pandemic is absolutely alarming. Uh, and the fact is that domestic work isn't recognized as work in many, many countries. Uh, and um, the least that uh, governments can do is um, uh, is to ratify the ILO Convention on Domestic Work so that uh, domestic workers are recognized as uh, workers. So I, I just wanted to sort of speak to those three things. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Nila. Gabriela, please. Well, um, I believe the the there's a big effort of the feminist movement in order to um, reclaim for the recognition of the paper of women as workers. Uh, neoliberalism especially try to put this as a cultural, as a statical issue. And we are calling this issue for the productive stru structure. And, and saying that to speak about gender and to speak about race is to speak about the capital working in the in the century. Uh, and to speak about the work rights, uh, we cannot uh, we we have to abandon this corporativist view because the work in neoliberalism is going uh, more and more. Um, 
I forgot the word, <laughs> sorry. Uh, in, form, uh, in the formality, in the uh, exploitation of work. And it's really important for the struggle to give space in the, in the elaboration of these social policies to another groups as the indigenous and the quilombola and the, the local movements. It's very important to include them in the debate and the formulation of these social policies. And uh, there is a question about the white supremacies. I think the American, and especially Latin America, it's very significant for us to understand how race can be used for uh, the domain and for the super the exploitation of uh, over some groups. So I believe it's really important to understand that the racial question, especially in America, is still a big issue. There is a lot of statistics that show that the black community, that black people are dying more from COVID than white people in Brazil. And uh, in all the statistics you see, there is a structural uh, inequality when it comes to race. And it's really important to address uh, these themes. Also, there is a question about if Caribbean is included in the salt salt analysis. The answer is yes. CEPAL includes the Caribbean in the numbers in the analysis of Latin America. So when it comes, we are talking about the same. From Mexico to down, we are talking about Latin America. And... Um, yeah, and ah, there is a question about if um, about the policies of cash transfers. Né? In many cases, it's the first access to some people of the labor reserves to uh, some money to the market relations. But I believe we cannot allow the neoliberal states to use these transfers, these cash transfers that are much cheaper from, for them. Uh, to destroy the social policies and especially the universalism that was conquered in Brazil. In Brazil, we have free health and free education, and this is uh, this is very attacked by the neoliberal project. So we cannot allow them to use the the cash transfers policies to hide a destruction of another very important policies as the free education and be free healthy because when it comes to responsibility of reproduction uh, we must to go toward a, a, a model where the state uh, comes and take the responsibility for the children for the limitation and, and think about these as common works that must be shared more equally in the society. Thank you very much, Gabriela, for those words. Achana, please. So uh, in the continuation with a few of the comments that have been made, uh, I just want to say, I'm in resonance with what Isa is suggesting. I just want to say that what Nijanjana called the other common sense, that other common sense will only be built through struggle. I don't think that it can be built only through discourse, but it has to be built through struggle and the learnings from the struggle. I can give you a couple of examples. For example, our teachers, and Praveen is here, he testified to it. Uh, our teachers uh, union had started a crash service for women workers. Now today, there's an attack on that crash service with the, with, uh, with the university wanting to take back that space. Now, the defense of that crash becomes part of our wider struggle. So in uh, when we are fighting for that trash service, we are also fighting for a common space for social, for child care and social reproduction. Now, a second example I want to give you that uh, uh, there was some talk about the women's strike, right? Now, to my understanding, 
the biggest domestic workers strike in india in the last 2 3 years has been alongside the workers strike or uh, the strike of the joint trade unions and this uh, strike also encompassed a lot of informal sector home based workers even though the leadership of this uh, uh, struggle was in some sense in popular perception in the formal sector workers the only point that uh, uh, i am trying to stress is that the project of reclamation or an alternative vision is going to be born through the experience of the actual struggle against neoliberalism and we have to learn how to theorize it better coming back to my original point and we have to learn how to theorize it better and and therefore our uh, 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 and therefore our understanding about uh, uh, the um, rights of women and a multitude of who are workers even within unpaid work within the house or outside the house a um, great multitude of who are workers are actually uh, going to be conditioned by the way in which we structure our struggles for an alternative world and to my mind the biggest challenge is that those people who profess to structure the struggle for an alternative world how we can negotiate and pressurize those movements to take on board our concerns and we have been successful to some extent but we need to be far more successful thank you thank you very much uh, achana i think all too soon we've come to the end of 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 this uh, webinar in the 9 minutes left to us i i just want us to um, sum up and make some announcements i think we've had a highly illuminating um, two two hours our panelists but not only our panelists but our contributors to to the discussion have all highlighted the deleterious effects on women and the working people of neoliberal economic policies and noted that these have been exacerbated and laid bare by covid-19 they've also drawn attention to the need to prioritize the questions of social reproduction and structural inequalities particularly those that render women as those who carry the burden of economic and social crises and the crisis of social reproduction and therefore the ones who are long with poor people are unable to lead dignified and productive lives what has been very important about this con conversation has been the numbers of strategies and alternative ideas and discourses that have been raised as well as questions about the struggles that we need to wage in order to build a new world order from the ashes of this damaging world economic order we've heard about this need to socialize social reproduction and the need to struggle for the unity of production and 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 reproduction and and thinking of of these resources as commons that all of humanity um, ha, um has to fight for i just want to underline that this conversation is one of several that are taking place in different hubs of the global south and even within this conversation we began to talk about the learnings from different areas of the global south and the fact that we need to continue these um south south conversations in order to fashion some clear demands as we struggle uh, going forward and particularly the issue of strengthening our movements to ensure that they are they are up to the task so to end i want to express our profound thanks to the panelists Nancy Dana Gabriela and Achana for representing our issues so well and for helping us to think of the ways um, forward. I also want to thank the contributors who sent questions to us who enriched this conversation by the comments they made and and and, and the uh, added dimensions they brought to 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 the questions. 
I especially also want to thank our supporting partners, particularly the Tri-Continental Logistics Team, who continue to live in the spirit of Bandun. They include Freedom Mazwi, Budget Malaka, Esha Chowdhury, Rajiv Gova, Lalit Dabral, Priyanka, Susan, and Julio Kambanko. To announce to us that we are in the happy position of stating the first Agrarian South Network Research Bulletin, which came out today. And I think this, this was an auspicious outing for the bulletin. It is one of a series of responses proposed by the network as a reflection on the unfolding COVID 19 crisis. This first issue has a reflection by Achana Prasad on paid domestic workers and the crisis of social reproduction in pandemic times, a perspective from India. We congratulate all the contributors to the bulletin, as well as the editorial team, Leno Some, Damien Lobos, Fridon Mazui, and Manish Kuma. You can find the details in the bulletin on the Agrarian South Network's Twitter and Facebook pages. So I urge you to take a look at it, and we can also um, send the link in the Zoom chat box for those who can access it. So if, if that's possible, let's, let's do that. And we welcome your contributions and participation in this uh, bulletin uh, exercise. Before I leave, I want to indulge myself in asking us to acknowledge the sad passing on 28th August of the erudite and progressive actor Chadwick Boseman. Who, for, who brought the Black Panther to life on screen and has inspired a new generation of long, young people across the world. In his Wakanda, women had a pivotal role in the fortunes of the kingdom. May the movement he has helped to spawn remain true to this vision of another world and may he rest from his labors. Hamba Kakle, Chadwick Boseman. I also want to announce our next session of the dialogue and it will be on September 23rd, at the very same time as we've had this one. And our speaker will be none other than Professor Jayati Ghosh from JNU in New Delhi. And she'll be speaking on the possibilities for progressive fiscal strategies in the COVID-19 world. So I'd like to bring our webinar to an end with my thanks to all of you for joining us today. Thank you and goodbye.